Hey guys, and welcome back to another Hat Tricksy video. We recently visited the Maryland Soccerplex, home of the Washington Spirit, to interview three amazing people. The first, Richie Burke, head coach of the Washington Spirit. Let's get to it. And don't forget to order your own Hat Tricksy shirt. More info in the description. Okay, now to the interview. All right, so we're here with Richie Burke, the head coach of the Washington Spirit, to um, discuss more of the uh, transition between the youth and professional levels, and especially about player development uh, across the different levels as you guys up. So uh, it's very nice to have you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you stopping by and seeing us today. Yeah. Um, all right, so the first question I have is, um, how have you approached uh, player development in different levels, um, seeing as you used to be on the youth level, now you're the professional level? You know, I, I'm very much followed a, a, a process through which I was educated in the UEFA system. So most of my badges through the professional level are the UEFA process, um, which is a little bit difficult and different in America because we have different lines of delineation between you know, schools and school systems. And generally, the, the American system has done a fantastic job of delineating at the right time of, time of cognitive, coordinative development change. So making sure that you apply curriculum that fits to what, you know, that the four pillars are psychosocial, physiological, cognitive, and coordinated. Making sure that your training sessions, your plans, your information, everything you provide for players that fits at the right time is important. Here, obviously, at the professional level, that's a given that they've gone through that entire process. So we can be a little bit more tactical, but it's not as as um, technical as, as you need it to be. What has been your favorite part about becoming a coach and like kind of getting into all? My favourite part, um, you know, I spent a lot of time away from the professional game after I finished as a player mm -hmm. to sort of sacrifice a little bit. Um, but getting back into the professional game, which I missed, you know, missed as a player, missed as a coach. Um, I was involved with DC United at first team under Ray Hudson, which was great. But um, going back to Scotland and taking a professional team, um, really got the competitive juices going again. And now back in the fray with this group is, is great. It's, it's, Thoroughly totally enjoyable. They're a great group of players, fantastic personality, so I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. What kind of components have you like applied from like being a player and now like as like a coach? What kind of things have you applied to them? You know, I, I like to think as a player, I was a very cerebral player, very thoughtful. I wasn't the most athletic, didn't get about the field as quick as some players, so I had to think an awful lot to make sure I was using my soccer IQ. And I think that that's what I like to apply to my teams. You know, our teams like to, to pass the ball, keep the ball. Possession and ball retention is a big component for us. Um, so if we do have pieces where we can we can be damaging in the final play with some pace and some speed. But most of the part, for the most part, for me as a player, I like to keep the ball. I like to chase and defend. So keeping the balls it was an important component. And that's what we like to do in our teams. Some of the big problems with with um, teaching it to the youth players is you know, sometimes it's possession for possession's sake. And you know, you, you, Barcelona are a fantastic model to watch, but you know, death by a thousand passes sometimes doesn't work at the youth level. Yeah. So you have to balance off between again having that, that principle of ball retention. That's a major principle. Like, you know, methodology is one thing, but a principle of play is retaining the ball, but retaining it with a purpose, retaining it so that it's got an end product. Is there any way that you've um, kind of changed the way that you coach from? Coaching at the youth level to coaching now, or has most of it stayed kind of the same? Well, I think it's a great question. The the principles of play don't ever change because football is football. If it's the men's game, it's the women's game. If it's the youth game, it's the senior game. Football is football. And if you've got the principles of play, then you have to be true to those. And I think I, I try to stay as true as I possibly can to principles of play. But at the professional level, you can demand a little bit more because they actually get paid to play. And you know. I say all the time to people, the big difference between amateur or college players and professional players, you know, professional players always work on things that they need to improve upon, they need to get better, they work on the weaknesses. Whereas youth and college players, they tend to spend a lot of time working on things that they're good at, because that's what got them recognition and that's what gets them a little bit status. But pro players are like, well, hang on a second, I'm always looking for my next contract or always looking for my next pay packet, and I have to make sure that I'm, I'm relevant. And uh, that's the big difference, I think. And, you know, youth players sometimes, if they, if they can get past someone in the right and take a right for shot, score goals, they go to that, they go to that, they don't even say, you know, maybe next time I need to go my left and hit up my left foot and be a little bit more balanced. Pro players are always constantly looking for that little piece to make them the next level. What kind of like traits do you like look for in a 
professional player, like, especially like on your team? You know, if any coach tells you that they're going to have favorites, they're lies. Right? <laughs> coaches always have favorites because they like to see players who are sort of in their image or in what they think in their mind is the image of themselves. <laughs> That's sort of what happens. So I like the, the thoughtful, creative, skillful players. You know, we have got some great defenders who I never really undermine. But because I was never really a great defender, you know, I just I appreciate them and I value them. But I, I really resonate and really empathize more with the players who've got a little bit of creativity, a little bit of flow, a little bit of style, a little bit of football IQ that changes matches. They're my sort of favorite types of players. Um, but you know, in, in professional football, you have to, all, have to have all different pieces. You have to have that piece plus a defensive minded piece plus a very cut thrust direct piece. So making sure that we get a marriage between all of those is important. For me, I like the skill for style of skill. Like in terms of like player development, um, what do you think like has to improve, like especially like in the youth game? Um, like what things do you think they need to change to uh, improve the development of their athletes? Well, that's a great question. So let me give you a couple of examples, right? Um, I think there is too much emphasis on sideline coaching in the youth game. The game belongs to the players; it doesn't belong to the coaches. Our job is to give you the framework or the blueprint to go play, and now you won't express yourself. So I was over in Holland during my UEFA course, and we were at one of the professional football clubs, and one of the 14 teams came out to play an 8v8 situation, and they decided to set the field up in a triangle. The field was a triangle, and if you were the red team, the coach said, "Here's your goal. Go place it anywhere in the triangle. You defend that goal. You're the blue team. Here's your goal. Go and put it anywhere in that triangle. You defend the goal." So one team put it on the sideline, the other team turned it around facing the apex, so it's facing out the way the apex, which is pretty smart. So now the game gets going on. No, none of the coach said anything, no coach told them what to do. Every time the team that was attacking the goal was facing the apex, posted a player up in the apex so we could play up, find and score. Nobody told them to do that. The players themselves worked it out. So again, when we, we say the game belongs to the players, you have to let them figure some things out and let them things out. Again, retain your principles of play, but let the players work out how to be successful. There's just simply not enough of that because so many coaches believe that the results and the success of their team in terms of results is a direct reflection on them as a coach. And that's, you know, I can stand on the sideline with a team full of rock stars and win games. I'm really doing a better job as a coach here on my sideline, and I've given my players who are not so good the opportunity to progress and, and grow. I was lucky, you know, to play as a professional footballer, but I do not remember one match that I played in under the age of 40. I don't remember one game. I can I remember matches and incidents, but I don't remember scores. I don't know, yeah, well, I remember one time we beat Braddock Road 4-1, and I played. I don't remember that. I don't, that's not what I remember. I remember instances where. You know, we had really good sequences and we and I, and I progressed and you know, might have scored a good goal or might have made a great pass down the line and those things that elevated me above the rest of the players. I remember that. But I don't you know, as far as all time as a kid, I never played on a winning team. So the emphasis too much at the youth level is win, 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 and results, results, results. Now, you, you two, whether you accept it or not, you've benefited just as much in your youth development in games where you've lost as much as you've won. There's been just the same amount of growth and development. I mean, that's definitely like, prevalent like in like the high leagues that we play. Like right yeah. now we're at UCL. Right. And like um I mean it's all about winning. We would just get went to like nationals in San Diego, so right. I mean it's but, but let me tell you and that's the, the rat race sort of that is youth football. And that's the biggest hurdle to sort of overcome. You will still be recruited to play in college by a college coach if they see you play on a not so good team, but you can play. So the, you know, unfortunately the ECNL and the DA, when it comes to college recruitment, they might have the corner office, but it doesn't mean to say that it's the only place to go and be seen to play in college. Whereas everybody in youth football, that's the Nirvana. You know, in, in Europe, becoming a professional footballer is the Nirvana. Here, it's not playing college, but playing college. And it really, you know, challenges you towards this, this system that's been put in place by people, and everybody buys into it, unfortunately. It's the biggest issue. What goals do you have um, as you keep going with the Washington Spirit? What goals do you have uh, within the professional league? Yeah. Uh, I like the party team to be perennial champions. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be producing as many national team players as we possibly can, US and other. I'd like to be working with a, a, a club 
that is well regarded universally in this league and internationally as a place to go and play a great brand of football. Uh, and I think that our aspirations are to be the best female football player in the world. And how do you as a coach um, help and like, encourage your players to kind of see those goals and like, um, have everyone have the same mindset? And again, it's a great question. It's a great segue into what we need to talk about because it's a mentality. You know, we, we've got a mural in our players' locker room that they look at every single day and it says women are happy. So we are in the biggest mission that we have to be and how we came involved in this for people is to completely a bad face on the mentality instead of a victim mentality or we're going to lose mentality. It's like, hey, hey, we're here to win. We're here to win this league. We're not here to just, you know, show up and participate. We're here to take over. And that's been our mindset from the get-go. And we've tried to comply that. For some of the players who've been here during tougher times, it's been a harder task. For some of the newer, fresher faces, they've had an immediate buy-in which is why we've had some degree of success this season. But once we get all of our pleasure, everybody's embracing that mentality of football places. What do you think was the greatest shift like, to that success? Well, again, a buy-in from the players on our methodology and our principles. We're going to pass the ball, keep the ball. We have targets of 600 plus passes and 60% possession and greater chance creation than everybody else. We've made that really a, a huge impetus from day one when we came in. We've also changed our training mentality. When we train, we train like champions. When we train, we, we train at a high intensity level. We've got a, a new high performance coach that has um, been fantastic with their the data and their the data analytics for us. So we've, I think, across the board, we've given them an entirely new professional experience that has been born out of you know, my experience in, in Scotland, the professional team and Michael's experience with Aston Villa in Brazil. And, uh, and Tom with East United team. So the, the, the technical staff is, is from a professional background. So um, how do you see like the NWSL, the, uh, the league growing in the future, like, not only as the Washington Spirit, but as the league in general? Hopefully it follows the pathway of the MLS with the uh, expansion in terms of number of franchises, the interest in the game that grows gates, a um, couple of franchises that max out with big crowds, and hopefully the, um, the salary cap that continues to grow and escalate so the players get the, a remuneration package that they deserve. There's definitely been a growth, especially like uh, in the women's game, like in Europe, and I don't think that's going to help them. Well, I influence it, 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 I think it sends a, a warning shot right across the bows because of, you know, the majority of revenue in the game in general comes from these European leagues and European TV deals and, you know, European Champions League, and that's where massive amounts of revenue coming into the game. So if now those men's teams are putting some of that revenue into female teams and making that product in your you know a variable success, then we have to watch out because it's, it's gonna be a major problem. I can't say to some of my superstars like Andy Sullivan, hey don't go and play for Barcelona when they're offering you multi six dollar figure deals. You know? I can't say that because if we're not we're going to compete with them, then we're going to have a hard time keeping our quality and talent as well. How do you, as a coach, um, approach like pre-game Like, do you have a pre-game ritual as a coach? Like, how do you like? <laughs> I'm extremely superstitious. I, I try, if we win a game, then I, I try to wear those exact clothes. If we lose a game, I'll never wear them ever again. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's certain things yes. I like to like before a game. I go to the same restaurant and the same suit, same food every win. If we lose, then I'll never go to that restaurant again. Um, so yeah, I, I'm working. <laughs> well, uh, do you have like any last like advice or last words for like any young athletes uh, that want to go to that level, professional level? Chase your dream. Never stop chasing your dream. Um, there are players who, even in this league, don't really aspire to stardom until a couple of years down the. the the, the track and you know it's not immediate success is not always immediate and sometimes it's worthwhile to invest in as much as you can for as long as you can so that you reap rewards down the track and try to be patient in that but again as a young player you know I, I there's a lot of people who try to influence you you know they're trying to pull you off that path your path is your own path you need to be strong enough mentally strong enough in terms of commitment to stay on that path. And if you don't, you'll never actually reach your dreams. Thank you, Richie. You're very welcome. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs>